Hello and welcome to the 2021 Photonics Spectra Conference hosted by Photonics Media. In this track, we're covering the latest in optics applications, trends, and developments in instrumentation with experts in the fields. My name is Sarah Weiler and I'm the Photonics Media Webinar Coordinator. You're joining us now with Jesse Hoskin, Product Engineer at Radiant Vision Systems. In this session, she will be introducing colorimetry, a primer on the science of color measurement. Welcome, Jesse. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Sarah. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation, Colorimetry, a primer on the science of color measurement. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to be here today and hope you'll find the session um, educational and a little bit fun. So I'll jump right in to getting started um, with the very basics. What is color and how does the human eye perceive? So this will help us to understand how we can apply our human vision to measure color as meaningful values that describe how we see light and light emitting elements. So what is color? Um, the funny thing about color is that in a sense, it doesn't really exist. Um, electromagnetic energy certainly does exist. It's made of photons moving through space. Uh, we describe these photons uh, by their energy or wavelength. So here we have a image of the entire electromagnetic spectrum um, with the very high energy gamma rays over here on the left and the longer wavelength low energy waves over here on the right. Um, we'll see a very small sliver here in the middle, um, which represents the wavelengths that our human visual system respond to. So we call this visible light. The unique way that we perceive these wavelengths based on the response of our visual system provides what our brains understand as color. Okay, so color is just some one subset of light waves. We don't see all wavelengths of light and we also don't see wavelengths the same way as other creatures do. So here's an example you might be familiar with showing how a human perceives a color of a flower versus kind of a representation of how a honeybee might see the same flower. Because honeybees are able to perceive light in the ultraviolet spectrum of wavelengths that are invisible to us. So the human eye is a very specially calibrated optical instrument, and if we want to measure light in the way that a human sees it, we're not really concerned with measuring all wavelengths of light, which a lot of instruments are able to do, and we don't want to measure light in the same way that other creatures see it. What we really need is a method and some specialized measurement tools to match the visual response of our eyes for these specific wavelengths that are visible to us. So why is it so important to match human visual perception when measuring color? Um, the answer is that human visual perception ultimately determines our understanding of the quality of light, including the accuracy and appearance of colors and devices like light sources or displays. So it really makes sense then that we want to be able to measure color in the same way that the human eye perceives it to ensure that the visual quality of the device matches human experience. Right, so before we consider how the human eye responds to wavelengths of light, I first want to talk about how we can describe uh, the unique output of a given light source. So every light source produces what we call a spectral power distribution or SPD. Um, the SPD of a source shows um, the intensity or power of the source at each wavelength along the visible spectrum. So here's just a couple of examples of different SPDs. Again, we have the visible spectrum in nanometers on the x-axis and power on the y-axis. Um, in this graph we see the SPD of a D65 light representing sunlight, um, a illuminant A standard source, a blue LCD screen, a red LED, than a very narrow um, red helium neon laser. So we'll get used to seeing this kind of graph throughout the presentation showing the visible light spectrum in terms of wavelength and power. So I wanted to introduce that here. Um, so SPDs are a property of light, but they don't really tell us how these light sources look to our eyes. And the concept of metamerism explains this pretty well. Um, it describes how different SPDs can actually look the same to our eyes. Um, a good example in this illustration shows four different, pretty drastically different um, SPDs that will all appear white to the human eye. 
And these are uh, sunlight, a white LED, an incandescent, and a CFL. Um, here's another quick example. If we imagine this diagram as if it's you know, a light being projected onto a wall, we can imagine that we're looking at just a green source, you know, producing wavelengths in the range that we perceive as green. Or we could be looking at multiple sources emitting multiple wavelength ranges that combine to stimulate our eyes in the exact same way as just the green color. So as we go through this webinar describing how the human eye perceives color, it's important to keep in mind that what we're really looking to measure is our perception of light and not necessarily the source's SPD itself. So our human eyes are sensitive to color and brightness, not power. So when we're, um, what we need to consider when we're measuring light is both the SPD of a source and of course, how our eyes respond to it. And our perception of each wavelength of light comes from our eyes cones. There are three different cones in our eyes that are each sensitive to a specific range of wavelengths, um, long, medium, and short. This little graph in the lower right shows a rough illustration of the normalized response of each of the cones in our eyes, you know, how powerfully we perceive each of these wavelengths uh, to be. So again, we don't see individual wavelengths. Instead, we see the sum total of light that all of these curves are sensitive to. Um, something else to note is that it's really kind of impossible to perceive the pure signal from just one of our one of the cones in our eyes. Um, because the wavelength ranges that they are all sensitive to all overlap by at least two different cones throughout the entire spectrum. So we'll use these curves to quantify uh, color based on what we call our human spectral response, that is our eyes response to spectral data, like an SPD. But what we need to do first is to find a standard mathematical way to measure the response of these three cones um, <clears throat> to a given source's SPD. That's what I'll get into next, um, really quantifying our human perception of color. So this is what brings us to the science of colorimetry. Uh, colorimetry is the science of measuring color as perceived by the human eye. Um, our perception of color in terms of perceived intensity per wavelength is kind of weighted by these spectral response curves. And the aim of colorimetry is to derive a single objective value for the combined area underneath these response curves covered by a source's SPD. So I'll give you an example of that here. Um, a colorimetric measurement is that the quantification of the combined value below our spectral response curves. So this is kind of a rough example. I'll go into more details on the next slide. But here we have the SPD of sunlight in the background. And overlaid, we have these spectral response curves. The area underneath these curves is really what we see. It's what we interpret as the light and color. Um, so to give you a little bit more detail here, um, we want to understand our spectral response for all kinds of light sources. So colorimetry gives us a way to quantify our response in this way for any SVD or source. Um, Again, what a colorimetric measurement will give us is a numeric value to describe our visual perception of a source. Um, and we need this so we can communicate about color objectively, as we know we all perceive color a little bit differently. But with colorimetry, we can make sure that we're all speaking to the same standard and speaking the same language regarding color. But the first step to getting these values is to document what I'm calling these spectral response curves shown here. So how do we even know what these are? That's what I'll get into next. So here we'll take a trip back in time and learn a little bit of history. So James Clerk Maxwell was one that first demonstrated that these three primary colors, red, green, and blue, can be used to create almost any other desired color. He experimented using a group of observers who were asked to adjust the brightness of um, primary colored lights to match a white target. Um, later on in the 1920s, David Wright and John Guild continued similar experiments to evaluate how much red, green, and blue light was necessary to see any color in the visible spectrum. Um, their work taught us that there's a link between wavelengths and the color that the, and colors that the human eye can perceive. 
Um, more importantly for us, they taught us that the amount of each primary color necessary to produce each perceived color can be measured across a set of standard observers. So Wright and Guild's experiments provided us with a set of trichromatic coefficients or curves for each of the three primaries. Um, these coefficients allow color to be measured in terms of the human eye's response to a wavelength. So these color matching functions, as they're called, um, were later standardized by CIE, or the International Commission on Illumination, um, and they provide the basis for the quantifiable representation of the human spectral response. Wright and Guild's experiments also included what we call a chromaticity diagram. This is a two-dimensional representation of the total perceivable color space where the values derived from the RGB source input and trichromatic coefficient calculations can be plotted. So the CIE color space encompasses all colors that the average eye can see. Um, this diagram was also standardized by CIE in 1931, and that diagram is shown here. So finally, um, kind of bringing it all together on this slide, we have these formulas that um, calculate what we call color coordinates or color values, you know, x, y, u, v, u prime, v prime. And in order to get these, we take our, you know, SPD of a source weighted by our CIE color matching functions. This provides us with these integral values, x, y, and z, which we can then or capital X, Y, and Z. It's important to separate these out from the lowercase x, y, u, v coordinates. And these capital X, Y, and Z values um, can be entered into these formulas, which provide us with uh, color coordinates. So there's a lot going on in this slide. I want to break it up into its kind of component parts and go through a couple examples, especially doing this math here. So we'll start with um, calculating X and Y color coordinate values of a blue LED. So what we need to ca calculate this color coordinates are, first the human spectral response curve, that curves that we have shown on the screen now, and then the SPD of a light source. So say we're looking at a blue LED with a spectral power distribution that looks like this. Um, what we're interested in doing when we and our next step is by taking kind of the integral of the combined curves or the area underneath both of these curves. And these give us our capital X, Y, and Z. So in this case, we have a really large area underneath our Z curve covered by the blue LED. We have kind of a small X value and an even smaller Y value. So we're going to plug those sizes or values into our formulas down here. Um, representing the size of the values with areas or with arrows here. So very large Z, very small Y, kind of a medium small X. We plug those into our CX and CY formulas, we get a small CX, even smaller CY. Um, we then plot that on our chromaticity diagram. It puts us down here in the lower left hand corner uh, in the blue area. This makes a lot of sense because we started with a blue LED. So I want to give you another example. Um, this time we're looking at the SPD of sunlight, which is of course much more broad spectrum. Um, and in this case, the areas underneath our curves for each X, Y, and Z will all be very large. So when we plug those into our CX and CY formulas, we get about you know, a medium CX and CY. It actually puts us right in the middle of our chromaticity diagram here at white. Okay, so now I want to take a step back and talk in a little bit more detail about this CIE chromaticity diagram. Um, so while this diagram relies only on X and Y coordinates, the color space is really in 3D, and the chromaticity diagram is kind of a projection onto two dimensions. Uh, as you recall, we have integrals for X, Y, and Z, and um, so in a sense, this Z value kind of comes out of the page at us. Uh, this video here is a great example that illustrates you know, the three-dimensional gamut being projected onto a two-dimensional space. Won't get into too much detail about this here, but if you're interested, I'd recommend checking out this video. So 
couple more aspects about the CIE chromaticity diagram I wanted to point out. You'll notice along the edge, we have these values here in blue. That might look familiar. These are the wavelengths in the visible spectrum. So if we were to plot a very pure light source, something like the laser, um, the point would be, the point of color would be somewhere very close to the edge or around what we call the spectral locus. As we mix colors together, we might get closer and closer to the middle, similar to how a white LED might be using RGB primaries to produce a white color. This curved line here is called the Planckian locus or black body curve. Um, this is where we define color temperature. Um, this is used often to, buy, to bin light sources like white LEDs. So if you ever hear the term CCT or correlated color temperature, it's kind of a quick way to define whether a white source is kind of cooler or warmer, depending on its CCT or temperature in Kelvin. Next, we have an example of a color gamut. So say we had a smartphone display, and if we were to turn it on to full blue, we might get a color over here. If we were then to turn it on to full green, we might see this green point here, and then full red place us here. Um, that would mean that any color that the smartphone device is able to produce would fit inside this white triangle here. And that's called the smartphone's color gamut. So displays often have a color gamut specification. The larger the gamut gets, the more colors it can produce. For certain industries, expanding the color gamut is a big priority. You know, as consumers, we tend to want more vivid colors, bluer blues and greener greens. So one way that the CIE chromaticity diagram is used is to standardize the way that tolerances are set for the color that a device produces. So it's great to be able to output a chromaticity value that reflects what we see. But when we're making a product, it's really helpful to be able to also set an acceptable, an acceptable range for what that color can be. I'm using numerical tolerances for pass fail. So I'll describe that a little bit more by introducing the concept of McAdams ellipses. So McAdams ellipse is a region on the chromaticity diagram um, that shows kind of the areas in which uh, color would be indistinguishable to the human eye. So in other words, all colors within these ellipses would be indistinguishable to us. It's important to note that these ellipses on this diagram are represented at 10 times their actual size. So not everyone uses the 1931 chromaticity diagram. And one reason for that is that there's kind of a limitation to the 1931 diagram in that not all colors are kind of weighted equally. And we can see that clearly by looking at the McAdams ellipses. We can tell that up here in the green, they are very large compared to down here in the blue where they're quite small. So this means if I wanted to set a pass-fail tolerance on the colors that my device can produce, say 0 0.01, um, that tolerance would represent a pretty significant change in color down in the blue, but a very small change in color up here in the green. So if we want to set the same tolerance across all of our primaries, uh, we might prefer to use the 1976 version of the CIE chromaticity diagram. Here we can see that kind of all of the McAdams ellipses are much more uniform, similar in size and shape compared to the 1931 version. So at their core, colorimetric measurements will be the same regardless of the diagram used because they both utilize the same the capital X, Y, and Z integrals. Um, from there, it's just a matter of using different formulas to calculate the um, color coordinates. Okay, so the functions, the formulas, and the, the values that we've used so far to describe our spectral response can be applied in the optical design, mechanics, and calculations of measurement instruments, thereby enabling automated color measurement. As we set out from the start of this presentation, the purpose of understanding um, the principles of color perception and how to quantify it is to enable human-centric measurement. So there's a couple of measurement systems that allow us to uh, quantify these values quickly and accurately. That's what I'll get into next. Um, you may have heard of a number of these technologies, including the spot meters, spectroradiometers, and imaging colorimeters. Many of these instruments are found in labs and manufacturing environments where 
light source and color metrology are performed for product design and quality control. So let's take a look at a couple. Here we have a comparison matrix um, comparing a few different instruments. We're broken down this table both in the spot and imaging systems and kind of how the system measures color, whether it's a spectroradiometer or colorimeter. So a colorimeter uses a filter-based system that directly replicates our spectral response to light um, kind of out of the box. Uh, so it uses filters that have transmission that matches those CIE color matching functions. A spectrometer, on the other hand, uses a dispersive element that actually breaks input light into its separate wavelengths. So with a spectro spectrometer, we can actually measure the SPDs of a source directly. And then algorithms can be applied to that data um, to calculate the chromaticity coordinates or values that we discussed before. So really in all these cases, color measurement systems apply CIE color matching functions to calculate color values that accurately reflect human perception. Um, to give you a little bit more detail about how the spectrometer works, um, we have this slide here. So in order to use a spectrometer, basically um, point the instrument at the light source, light enters and passes through a slit. Um, the light is then reflected off a collimating mirror and onto a um, grating or prism. This is where the light actually disperses into its different wavelengths. Um, the separated wavelengths then get directed off another mirror and then onto a sensor um, in such a way that the specific wavelengths reach specific pixels on the sensor. Um, each pixel on the sensor then reports the intensity or power of each wavelength assigned to it. Um, this gives the raw SPD of the measured spot. Um, this kind of similar to how we can imagine a prism working with sunlight hitting the prism and breaking it up into its component parts. Um, a colorimeter, on the other hand, measures light through filters that directly mimic our spectral response. Um, so a colorimeter is a tristimulus system, which means that there's usually three filters that replicate the response illustrated by the three um, CAE color matching functions to give us our X, Y, and Z integrals. So this image here shows an imaging colorimeter that uses a moving filter wheel system. There are other ways to measure color with filters, but the filter wheel system tends to be most accurate for colorimetry. The way this works um, is we point our imaging system at a light source, and the colorimeter takes three subsequent exposures. First, the light passes through the green filter onto a CCD or CMOS sensor. This allows us to obtain our capital Y integral directly. Um, the filter is then rotated, and we get another exposure through X and then Z. So rather than measuring the raw power spectral, or sorry, the raw spectral power distribution of a source, the colorimeter allows us to measure the X, Y, and Z integrals directly. We can then use those integrals values to calculate chromaticity coordinates using our CIE formulae, the same way that we did in our previous examples. So these formulae are stored on the colorimeter system um, to calculate color measurement data automatically. Okay, the next comparison we'll make is quite a bit straight, more straightforward. Um, we'll look at the difference between spot measurement systems and imaging systems. So with a spot system, we're really just looking at one point at a time. To take a measurement, um, you point our device at the source, and what we acquire is just the average luminance and color over one small area. Um, a spot colorimeter takes a single spot measurement using a filter-based system, and a spot spectrometer, you're taking a spectrometer measurement just at one point. So rather than taking multiple measurements, um, one spot at a time, an imaging colorimeter captures an entire area over millions of data points. And um, these data points represent or reflect the number of pixels on the system's imaging sensor. Um, so to wrap up the presentation, I'm going to touch on some real world applications of color measurement. Um, using colorimetric systems, we can measure uh, things like displays, backlit components, or light sources. There really isn't much of a limit. Any light emitting device can be evaluated using color metric principles. Um, to measure displays in particular, um, using an imaging system allows us to perform these common tests 
explaining brightness and color uniformity and contrast, things like light leakage, mirror, and defect detection for pixels, lines, and particles. Um, other tests for particular applications might include things like image sticking, view angle performance testing, or testing the influence of sparkle introduced by anti-reflective or anti-glare coatings. Um, all these display tests can be performed on the backlit, backlit unit level, component level, or once the display is fully assembled. So although spot meters can be used for this kind of testing, imaging is very useful for displays because we can capture all areas of the displays to understand their contextual information. Without imaging, it becomes really difficult to measure uniformity or changes in brightness and color across the display. It also becomes virtually impossible to ensure that we capture and detect all defects that might be presented in the display's illuminated area. So continuing to look at um, display measurements as an example, I want to tie this back to the importance of color imagery. Um, so again, colorimetry gives us a measurement tool that can provide us with quantifiable values for what the human eye sees. So say I'm a display manufacturer and I want to measure, um, I want my display to have a gamut that includes this particular color blue. And ensuring that all my displays have this color blue, make sure that my customers will have the intended visual experience that I would like. Um, the values that colorimetry provide um, are also standard values because they're based on the universal scientific measurement principles, functions, and formula documented by the CIE, um, or again, International Commission on Illumination. So having a standard value means that no matter what I'm measuring or where I'm measuring it, I'm going to be using the same scale, and I'm going to be getting um, repeatable measurements from device to device. Uh, these standard values can also be understood by everyone, so we now have a common mathematical language to use um, when talking about color. So instead of telling my panel supplier, like, look at this blue, I need you to match it for us, I can instead tell my supplier that I need the blue to achieve you know, 0.1 in the x coordinate and 0.15 in the y coordinate um, using the CIE standards. So this means that my supplier and I can both use these same colorimetric instruments and standards to verify that this value is correct during manufacturing or quality assurance processes. Here are just a couple final more examples to demonstrate the versatility and effectiveness of imaging systems. So when we're looking at backlit symbols or shapes, for example, um, imaging is really critical for evaluating these illuminated areas, illuminated areas quickly and easily. In this case, we're looking at a dashboard, but we could be looking at um, you know, keyboard on a laptop or avionics control panel or a medical device keyboard, anything like this. If you imagine using a spot meter, you'd really have to go point by point throughout the entire display to ensure that each um, backlit component is matching our color and luminance standards. But using an imaging system allows us to capture the entire measurement at once, automatically find you know, each component and uh, apply pass-fail criteria directly to the measurement so we can test all of them at once. An imaging colorimeter is itself a complete measurement system, but it can also be paired with other equipment to accomplish different objectives. In this case, the system is paired with a goniometer to capture data for a 3D light source characterization and modeling. So this goniometer uh, rotates around this really small light source here, something like an LED, measuring the LED's illumination or LED's light distribution from all angles. Um, on the right, we can see a luminous intensity distribution plot in a combined measurement image. From our measurement data, we can then create things like IES, Illumbat, and radiant source models that are used in lighting design software. So that about wraps up my presentation. In summary, I hope that you've gained some valuable insight about the principles of colorimetry and its applications um, for color measurement. So in this presentation, We've shown that by quantifying our human spectral response, colorimetric measurement methods ensure that the source's color output accurately reflects human perception. Um, there are a number of color measurement systems from spot meters to imaging colorimeters. Um, imaging systems have the advantage of quick and comprehensive measurement for absolute color values across areas like displays and light source distributions. And finally, color, measure, 
calorimeters can be used for a range of measurement applications, even meeting multiple needs within a single system. So I'd like to thank you for your attention today. If human-centric measurement using calorimeters uh, piques your interest, I encourage you to check out other resources and webinars from Radiant at our website, or feel free to contact us. Um, with that, we'll enter a brief Q&A to address questions about color measurement. Thank you very much, Jesse. I do have a couple of questions for you. Sure. So my first one is, you've said that the CIE diagram shows all colors that our eyes perceive, but devices can only produce colors within a specific gamut. If that's the case, how are the colors in the diagram produ produced on this screen? Um, that's a great question. Uh, the CIE chromaticity diagram displayed on the screen that you're watching this presentation on is really just a representation of the actual diagram. You know, it's really not possible to see a true depiction of the diagram since all displays have some color gamut that um, falls somewhere within inside the CIE diagram itself. Right, thanks. Uh, what yeah. does the measurement look like for an imaging system that measures across the area of a displays? of a display. Is it a single chromaticity value for the whole display or can the system measure multiple values? For instance, if color changes across the display. Yeah, so a measurement using an imaging system actually gives us chromaticity values for every pixel within the measurement itself. So say we're measuring with like a 16 megapixel imaging system, we would then get 16 million different chromaticity values across our entire measurement. Um, so depending on what we're measure, measuring, we might be interested in kind of taking the average chromaticity over a given area um, or really looking at each individual pixel. This can help us to find really small deviations in color and brightness. So maybe one or two pixels on your display are the wrong color. Um, a measurement system allows us to find this. So the point is that having this many data points allows us for a lot of flexibility in measurement and measurement analysis. Great, right, thank you. I've got one more yeah. question. Does sure. it matter if I measure color using XY or U prime, V prime? Yeah, so the choice is really industry or application specific. As I mentioned earlier, using U prime or V prime has the um, advantage of making it a little easier to set uh, color tolerances that are the same across a whole color space, if that's what you want to do. Um, but ultimately, it really depends on your specific goals and um, the standards that are used by the people that you want to communicate with. All right. Thank you very yeah. much. And thank you, everybody, for participating in Colorimetry, the primer on the science of color measurement. This is part of the 2021 Photonics Spectra Conference Optics Track, hosted by Photonics Media. We're your source for global photonics news and education. You can explore more talks like this one and customize your personal event schedule on the Photonics Spectra Conference website. If you have any questions about the conference or how to use the site, please see our FAQs. Thanks for attending. Thank you very much, Jesse Hoskin. Thank you.